My name's Mary Schneider, as you know now. <laughs> My husband Steve and I and our daughter Katie, we'd like to share a very special story about our youngest uh, member of our family, Ryan. Uh, his medical problems began, began at birth. There were feeding problems right away. He was falling behind with his motor skills and his milestones. Uh, with the doctors, they kept saying, well, we're going to just wait and see. We're, every kid's different. Just give it a little time. We knew there was something wrong. Um, he only weighed 25 pounds, and he was in the one percentile for his age, which is very, very low. Uh, pointing, whining, and screaming were his only methods of communication. He could not speak. We had him evaluated through an early intervention program, and he was in speech therapy for about nine months. At that point, after nine months, he had only gained one pound, and he only had 40 words, most of which no one could understand but us, and sometimes not even then. His upper body strength was getting weaker. His hands were in fists most of the time, and he was pulling his arms in towards his body. It hurt him to straighten it out. He, I couldn't even wash his hands. The little things that only a parent would notice it sets the bells off usually. And I presented these concerns to Ryan's pre pediatrician who referred us to a neurologist. On the 21st of July last year, we got the diagnosis of mild to moderate C cerebral palsy. And my husband and I felt like we'd been punched in the stomach. To shed some light on, the con on this condition that currently affects over a half a million Americans about 6,500 new cases of cerebral palsy are diagnosed each year in infants up to preschool age children. The research for this currently focuses on prevention. Cerebral palsy is a general term that describes a group of disorders. It appears in the first few months of life and affects a child's ability to coordinate body movements, eating disabilities, and speech. These are just a few of the things that it affects. The light went on the following morning after we got Ryan's diagnosis. I looked at Steve and said, we saved his stem cells. I wonder if they're doing anything with it. For me, this was two plus two equals four. It just made sense. After two weeks on the net researching and many, many phone calls to leading researchers in stem, I'm sorry, stem cell therapy nationwide, I found very little, or in, little hope or information and a lot of, no, I won't do the transfusion. We were told that the spasticity in Ryan's hands, if it got bad enough, we could get Botox injections. But no one would give my son his own cord blood. You can get donated blood products from a stranger anytime for surgery or trauma. And the situation we found to be unacceptable. I called Dr. Harris, the head of the cord blood registry bank where Ryan's stem cells were stored. He suggested I get in touch with Dr. Joanne Kurtzberg at Duke University to see if she would do the infusion. Dr. Kurtzberg agreed, and Ryan's autologist transplant took, on, took place on October 11th, 2005. The procedure is really very simple. 20 minutes for the cells to drip in through an IV in the back of the hand, followed by a saline drip for two hours just to push things along gently. The stem cells know where they need to go, and they land there fairly quickly. Given this opportunity for Ryan, I set up a protocol system on my own. Pre and post infusion evaluations and progress monitoring is being done with Easter Seals DuPage. I, re I requested extensive metabolic and chromosomal blood tests to be done prior to treatment to rule out any possibilities with his pediatrician. My thought was, if this works for Ryan, it could change the lives, his life and the lives of many other children in the future. Although my efforts were applauded, this should not be the job of the parents.